Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. We've already been talking for an hour. We were previously joined by Molly White. If you haven't listened to it, I suggest you tune into our last episode. Today, we're going to be talking about Binance. And I think the main reason we're talking about this is because I was gone for so long that we didn't when it was actually transpiring. I want to compare, contrast, and think about what this could possibly mean for Binance. And when I say compare contrast, I mean against other exchanges that have had to deal with situations like this before. For anyone who's unfamiliar, I just want to say one, Binance is, I think, still the most liquid and um, voluminous exchange, cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Um, it is. It was founded by and largely operated by uh, Cheng Peng Zhao, uh, CZ, as he goes by uh, like online. They got in trouble. So um, yeah, let's talk about what that trouble was, what happened, and what it, it looks like is going to happen in the next few months. Well, the big important missing part is that uh, in November of 2023, Cheng Peng Zhao pled guilty and Binance agreed to a deferred prosecution agreement related to um, crimes committed at Binance, mostly surrounding money laundering, inadequate uh, know your customer, inadequate anti-money laundering, and other assorted financial regulations. As part of this, they resolved the case with the CFTC. They settled cases that had not yet been filed by like OFAC and FinCEN. There is still the ongoing SEC lawsuit that we've talked about before on here. Um, but the short version of this is Binance and Cheng Penzao were indicted for a bunch of financial crimes. I assume most of our listeners know this already, but what you're discussing right now are criminal charges, right? These yes. are, these are a- actually crimes that have possible prison sentences and other consequences associated with them, whereas the ongoing SEC suit, which you mentioned, does not have those same caveats. It is a civil suit, and so the concern is not the same for the SEC uh, as for these these criminal charges. But yeah, as far as I understand it, uh, this agreement was made, and CZ, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, is now in America, is that right? Yes. CZ is in America and seem well actually he was mostly in America. There was that negotiation over whether or not he could leave the country to go see a sick family member. And I thought it was likely that he was gonna get approval to go see the sick family member. So is he in the United States? I have no idea. Yeah, it was I was that was an honest question. I wasn't trying to there was no like um moving on to this he, topic. He's mostly been in the <laughs> United States. His request to return to the UAE just in general were rejected. But then he filed a specific request to go see a sick family member over like a discrete period of time, and that looked more likely to get approved, but now I don't remember if it did. What is CZ facing here with these, with this, if there is a, a ultimately, I know he's going to go to court. I know there's going to be, or some, there's going to be some sort of settlement with the government in one way, shape or form. Either he goes to trial or he reaches a settlement with these, with whoever he's facing charges against. But there's some very specific clauses to this agreement. Can can you delve into that a bit? I think what you're probably alluding to is the fact that he is unlikely to face substantial time in prison as a result of this plea agreement. There Specifically, he is granted the right to appeal if he is sentenced to more than 18 months in prison, is my understanding. And so it seems likely that in exchange for this plea and his continued cooperation, he will have a brief, if any, sentence in the penitentiary. Most people in the nation and across the world probably don't have a clue who Cheng Peng Zhao is and uh, don't know who CZ is in general. But I think for anyone in cryptocurrency, they're probably happy that he's... Binance and CZ are quite important to the cryptocurrency industry. So the idea that he's not going to immediately go to a long, crazy sentence like, say, uh, SBF or that he didn't just uh, exit scam or something like SBF. Cryptocurrency people certainly don't have as much of an issue with him as they do with plenty of other big name actors in the cryptocurrency industry. I am pretty disheartened with this deal 
not because I think, you know, I don't think at the end of the day, if we're looking at how many people were harmed, I don't think that that CZ harmed nearly as many people as SBF, uh, FTX, the FTX executives. But he certainly broke a lot of laws, like important important financial rules and regulations, um, stuff that like working with terrorists and, you know, like really not good, not good allegations. And the idea that he's, he's going to see probably less than a year in prison, if any prison time at all, that he's going to get a slap on the wrist, that's good enough for the government is a little disheartening to me. Maybe you feel differently about it. I don't think I feel that differently. And I think we've kind of talked about this before in this context is that it's the chicken shit club, right? Talked about in a Jesse Eisinger's book, uh, where he talks about how the cultural change in many of these prosecutors' office became so focused on like the win rate on making sure you never lost a case that many complex, difficult, or otherwise less than perfectly clean cases were not advanced, and there was an increasing emphasis among many of the lawyers who had the most to gain within the federal prosecutorial system by going for plea agreements, deferred prosecution agreements, and things like that, because they counted as a win without requiring the same investment or amount of difficulty as some of these other cases. We talked about way back, like when Bits Lotto came out, I think you and I made the prediction that Binance was very likely to be a deferred prosecution agreement. And the things we cited at that time were the fact that like, it's this largely international corporation with obviously some law violation of United States laws with some amount of nexus, but that prosecuting it and bringing that case was always going to be complex and challenging. The principles weren't primarily in the United States. Many of the assets were not necessarily in the United States. And so it wasn't a super clean case. Broadly, I think it would be good for our system to take white collar crime more seriously and treat that severity, like treat, treat the harm caused by white collar crime as significant as well. or. If you really do not believe much harm is arising from Binance's violations of these various laws, that suggests that there's some other problem in the laws themselves, right? If, if these prosecutors believe the laws are right, just, accurate, and generally well-founded, then they need to be treating these violations as more serious. And I don't want to understate the fact that Binance was an important tool for a variety of global money launderers, right? I don't want to overstate it either. Like there's people who are acting like all of Hamas's funding was passed through Binance, which is nonsense, right? But like Binance and many of these things were useful tools, were violating these regulations, and it often seems and feels as though that can all be forgiven in exchange for a one executive willing to serve a token amount a token sentence and compliance going forward. Can you speak on the compliance aspect of this and how Binance is uh, having to deal with the consequences of this agreement as well? Yeah, that I think is actually going to be one of the more interesting aspects of this and is really, I think, why the U.S. government agreed, like went for this instead. Uh, the U.S. government, um, I think it's DOJ, OFAC and FinCEN get to like embed a monitor in Binance who gets access to like all the financial transaction reports and audits and things like that. Oh, and they're going to need to like try to get audits and a bunch of other things like that to bring them into broader compliance. But yeah, Binance needs to effectively share almost all of their financial information with various agents of various U.S. government entities for the next several years. This, I think, is really why the government was willing to take this deferred prosecution agreement, right? is because Binance, as we've mentioned, was the largest volume exchange, was the most liquid exchange, and because of their historically lax views towards know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations, was a useful tool for people looking to move dirty money. And Binance itself was often complicit in this, as we've discussed on this podcast before, even like advising people directly, like make sure your flows aren't coming from Hydra, 
and things like that. Binance was, again, complicit in this very much. Um, And so the U.S. government now has a whole bunch of information about every single person, or at least some amount of information about every single person or entity who was using Binance in that way, and anyone foolish enough to continue using Binance in that way. Honestly, this is the crux of what I wanted us to talk about, because I think this ultimately... I guess we'll see how this, I don't make a lot of predictions, but I see this and I immediately think of um, BitMEX, which I don't know, probably most of our listeners at this point don't really know what BitMEX is. Um, It's, um, do they do, they do futures or spot? They do futures, right? Yeah, they're derivatives. Derivatives and futures trading of Bitcoin. Um, They were truly one of the largest when it came to volumes and movement they had such a massive insurance fund they um, owned a lot of bitcoins they were a powerhouse in the cryptocurrency industry ultimately their executive leadership um got caught up with u.s authorities so um arthur hayes ended up having to i don't think he did any prison time but he was basically on house arrest there were a couple other gentlemen who got in trouble as well and they also had pretty light sentences but i think the move by regulators was essentially you got to stop what you're the way you're doing business right now and get fall into compliance and your executive leadership has to go and so that happened and now no one no one no one uses bitmex no one talks about bitmex no one cares about bitmex i still think they have a great research arm actually Mm -hmm. like um and they track some really interesting data um so you know credit where credit is due there's still some interesting stuff going on over there at bitmex but um generally i don't hear traders talking about it or relying on it very much do you think that's what's going to happen with binance binance thought that's what was going to happen with binance right we've talked about the february 2019 messages and stuff before when they were going to start doing um kyc or blocking ip addresses from the us i mean they thought that if they did it at that point that it would negatively affect their volume And the history of cryptocurrency somewhat supports that, right? Like there's generally one, two or three kind of gray market popular exchanges that don't KYC very well that grow to take larger and larger portions of the volumes. And then they either like get hacked, go bankrupt or get in enough trouble that they start to slip away. The surprising thing about Binance was that even after they started to implement KYC, they didn't really slip away. And now we know from like the CFTC case and this uh, criminal prosecution that part of the reason they didn't really slip away is because they weren't really doing KYC, right? The kind of strange dynamic that's been interesting for me to watch since the indictment is how Binance has maintained their position so far. And that there's even been some like, strange bits of non-compliance that I can't quite figure out. Like there was a recent situation where like uh, Binance was supposed to be paying some fine in Uzbekistan related to non-compliance. And it was some piddling amount, like $8,000 or something, but they hadn't uh, paid it yet. And like that seemed extraordinarily strange because it's again, $8,000, which suggests to me that the efforts of the new compliance professionals hired since the indictment and the monitors still have a ways to go to bring Binance into compliance in every jurisdiction in which it currently operates. I would suspect, and maybe I'm wrong, but I would suspect that they're thinking about leaving a lot of jurisdictions that they're currently in. Well, I think practically they're probably going to have to, right? I'm being somewhat glib, but like most countries have at least some amount of licensing. And if you're no longer going to be able to really play into the grays by hoping most of these countries don't have the resources to really do anything about it, and now you kind of have to go along with them, you're going to fade to irrelevance as you end up with what licenses in the Bahamas, the UAE, and maybe Hong Kong. Like, that's not enough to build a cryptocurrency exchange around, regardless of what Kevin O'Leary might tell you. The actual enforcement action here wasn't really against uh, CZ at all. The real enforcement action is if they're able to get data and force compliance from Binance, I do believe it destroys Binance 
Binance's current business model. Um, it doesn't mean they go out of business right away. You know, BitMEX is still chugging. I bet BitMEX still makes a nice profit every year, too. Like, I don't think when I say no traders are utilizing it, I don't mean no traders. I mean, they're in, they're largely in compliance now. You don't have the same access to gray and black markets where you could just let a money launderer go and it didn't matter. And they they helped your bottom line. Uh, they can't do that anymore. Their profits shrink, their business shrinks, and they become more irrelevant because in cryptocurrency, the name of the game is volume more than anything else. And when that volume leaves, it changes everything. So I don't I don't know if there's a solid um, alternative to Binance right now. I don't really think there is. Justin's son wants to be that, but he's not solvent enough to pull it off. Yeah, and there's no way that he actually knows how to build something that's reliable and equitable and like good in general for everyone. I, I, I don't think, I don't even think that's necessarily something he wants to build. I don't think the idea of Justin's son making, what, uh, HTX, um, formerly Wobi, I, that's not never going to be a competitor um, to Binance. It already has a terrible reputation. I don't know what's going to take Binance's place. There will be something. Uh, I think the government always hopes, though, that it's similar to... Um, I, I'm thinking of a couple examples are uh, Liberty Reserve or Silk Road, where after Silk Road got shut down, well, yeah, like Silk, the next Silk Road came up and there's been a uh, hundred alternatives to Silk Road. But none of them have been as popular as Silk Road was or had the longevity that Silk Road had. And the same for Liberty Reserve, where it's like you had a illegal dollar derivative um, being used widely online. And when they shut that down, I mean, I guess Tether is <laughs> we won't get into that, but I but I don't think Tether certainly is far more in compliance than Liberty Reserve was when they were shut down at this point, I would say not to say they're perfectly in compliance or that what they do is acceptable in my book. It's not to be clear, um, but I do think that the government is hopeful that if by shutting down Binance without their not sh and sorry, not shutting down just forcing them into compliance that there won't be if there is nothing to take its to take its place right away you really do stifle the industry in a large way right i think your allusion to the dark web marketplaces is quite telling there and i'm thinking specifically of the benefits the alpha bay seizure had on the department of justice's ability to prosecute other cases that led to revealing rosal khan and dutch that led to bits lotto being taken out that contributed to Binance's indictment and it contributed to a bunch of other smaller firms down the way. I hope people remember that the vast majority of cryptocurrency blockchains are pseudonymous at best and because of their public nature as soon as like that pseudonym is revealed it's permanently revealed. And so, like, the U.S. government, after they seized Alphabet, were able to use the records of Alphabet to de-anonymize a bunch of other actors on the blockchain. Similarly, when they seize any other entity, they gain new information that gets fed into their chain analysis programs, which makes it possible for them to identify a larger and larger subset of addresses. This is why it's important when you hear, like, Tether's onboarding the FBI and the Secret Service. Binance is installing a monitor that gets to see every financial transaction and all historical records to determine like what SARS should have been filed and things like that. That means suddenly the the government has information on this massive quantity of addresses that interacted with Binance, interacted with Tether, which means they get a much better map of the current state of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And it means bad actors going forward need to be really careful with their OPSEC to make sure they don't like pull in funds from an address which was incidentally doxxed because of an interaction with Binance a couple years ago or something, right? And like that is the compounding effect of these government seizures on some of these things is it increases the government's ability to effectively surveil the various blockchains. This is a point you brought up when we were talking about Tether as well, where you said they onboarded the FBI and the Secret Service and that by by doing so, they are essentially granting them 
some form of access to stuff that the general public doesn't have access to and why there it would be wise for cryptocurrency advocates and people in the industry to reflect on that and perhaps worry about it a little bit. I, I brought up Liberty Reserve and Silk Road, but the other comparison that we could easily make is Bitfinex having to deal with all of these regulators falling into compliance, right? And yeah, they lost customers. It's not like they've gone away, but they lost customers. People left their exchange and then they went to BitMEX, which had already been functional and, and working at that time. And OK, so the, a lot of the customers then went to BitMEX. BitMEX has to get into compliance. Those customers now go to Binance. Well, now they're at Binance. Binance has to fall into compliance. I think it's just too easy to spin up an exchange and not have to do compliance for it to just go away. Like it's much more difficult to both create and garner a large audience for something like Silk Road than it is for a cryptocurrency exchange where you could pretty much buy a white label, um, white label exchange on the market for whatever kind of cheap numbers you need, hire a staff for relatively cheap of not that many people, if you don't have to do that much compliance, you really don't have that many staff members on board. And then if people hear about it and you get traction, boom, like it just seems like uh, it's just too easy to stop to to make this. It's almost impossible to stop, in my opinion, for another large exchange to eventually take over. Maybe like I think we have seen some new kind of um, constricting of some of that, right? Like. Binance had quietly become one of like the top new white label providers for a lot of new exchanges spinning up, right? And so they're not going to be able to as easily fulfill that capacity anymore. Or there'll be trade-offs involved in people who want to white label using Binance. Uh, many of the kind of payment processors, like Crypto Capital Corp, one of their initial selling points is that you'd be able to like use their white label exchange tie directly into like their payment rails and have an exchange set up like days later, right? And other payment providers have tried kind of similar pitches and many of those payment providers are no longer. And the first solution you then say is, okay, then they'll just be stablecoin exchanges, right? They'll be white label stablecoin exchanges. And yeah, that works. But like the, the more layers, like the more difficult it is to onboard people, the less substantial those exchanges become. And this also gets into kind of a question of what was Binance's volume? Was the majority of it legitimate? Was this legitimate volume driven by retail traders interested in speculation? Was this bad actors interested in trying to clean dirty funds? What was the primary draw and what would allow that to be replicated? Because you're right, it is relatively easy to spin up a white label exchange and list every shitcoin ERC-20 and trade it just against Tether or TrueUSD if you want. But that, I think, has become somewhat less appealing to a lot of traders. Um, and if that's all you why want... Do you say, why do you say that? Because to get the stablecoin, you already need to be on a centralized exchange generally or have cryptocurrency and so if you're already on coinbase and you're you're a new shitcoin trader and now coinbase lists a whole bunch of shitcoins are you really going to be like oh it's worth me sending this over to ltx in order to trade this other shitcoin that coinbase doesn't list maybe but like i also feel like DeFi, uniswap pancake swap sun swap whatever swap is used on your particular chain or corner of degen world that fulfills some of that kind of like raw degen like i feel like it kind of there's less space for binance because the raw degens end up just on DeFi, and the people not smart enough to end up in DeFi end up on coinbase do you think that's maybe the answer though then like do you think that there's a place where one of these decentralized whether it's uniswap or one of these other decentralized exchanges <clears throat> creates a platform that is easy enough to access for the average person um, 
could that be the future? Is that like actually where the next big exchange is? And if so, how would the government try to stop something like that? I mean, I would say that the government would try to stop it the way they kind of already did with Uniswap, right? Is you go to Uniswap Labs and you say, yeah, if you guys are going to host the front end for this, now you're going to change your token list and remove these tokens we don't like. Um, and the counter to that, assuming DeFi actually works, is alternative front ends or people running their own front ends or distributing their own token lists or whatever. The people who are looking for the convenient thing are going to end up in the more centralized locations because the advantage of centralized locations is that you can make it easier, simpler, more straightforward. And so the government just needs to progressively target some of those things. And again, you can kind of squeeze it a little bit here, right? You put the pressure on Coinbase to delist a bunch of things. You limit what Coinbase can advertise and you cut off the number of people who enter that part of the funnel. You pressure Uniswap and anyone else with front ends you can kind of reach to add in these token lists and you make people have to go out of their way to get some of these other tokens. And like at a certain level, there's no point in really trying to eradicate it because like it's kind of like online poker. The people who were still doing it at a certain point, the effort required to stop them was disproportional to the harm they were causing to others, right? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's been uh, interesting to see this play out because it's so much different than FTX. It's so much different really than, than even BitMEX or Bitfinex. But it does sort of feel like um, CZ and Binance are, are really getting off pretty easy. And I suspect like, I mean... You know, CZ is going to walk away from this, still a billionaire, still with his house in order, um, and still he's going to be able to obviously influence the industry as soon as he walks out of prison again. Um, and I assume he'll spin up a new exchange when he gets out. Uh, it feels like the government took a pretty easy W instead of trying for a much harder W. But I, but I do, I do appreciate your perspective in that. At this point, doing this could truly stifle a lot of the bad actors in cryptocurrency in general. Well, and to be clear, I don't I, I don't know fully that I buy their justification. Like I know that is their justification, and I can like figure out the steps that convince them it's true in their head. But like at a certain point, and we discussed this, I think in the example of Paul LaRue might be kind of the best case we discussed this in that. At a certain point, you have the top of the food chain. <laughs> mm. Stop trying to flip. Stop trying to get more. You've identified the top person. You're, you're now flipping down the chain at smaller actors because you can get a few more of them. Focus. Focus. You've got it right there. Paul Levu is sitting in front of you right the fuck now. Chang Pen Zhao is right there in front of you. Prosecute the case you have instead of trying to set up a dozen other ones, you know? But listen, I'm not a prosecutor. I'm shooting off the cuff, whatever. Yeah, we're just assholes talking on a podcast. And I think that's that is actually the correct take. You know, they, we are not lawyers. And uh, the idea we we could easily like, why don't you just prosecute Binance and get CZ? Like, yeah, OK, it's easy for us to say that. It's a it's a tough job. Come here. Come here. You're going to help me with this. If you want lunch, you have to help me. Come here. Come here. You got to help me. Come here. I'm here. I'm trying to help me out, okay? Do you want to be Cascoin? If she wants to be Cascoin C, if she wants to be Cascoin CEO, she's got to do a little bit of work. It's not just all sleeping burrito, burrito. It's who not all really sleeping. pulls? Who really pulls the strings at Cascoin though? Well, you're looking at the Cascoin CEO right now. I'm trying to get her to agree to an interview, but you know what? Forget it. Forget it. All right, Cascoin. Cascoin. Uh. CEO isn't up for the, uh, we're going to do an AMA, but forget it. Burrito comes from the Jean Ludovicus Vanderbilt <laughs> School right. of CEO, not the Palo Arduino <laughs> CEO. She is, CEO. she is not like CZ. She is not tweeting, tweeting, tweeting things out and doing AMAs. Okay. Enough, enough.